I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. Today, we welcome Sean Bernstein to the podcast, a good friend and colleague who is a journalist, turned lawyer, turned storyteller, and owner of the Right Stuff Agency. But that doesn't do him justice, so I'm just going to introduce him. Hey, Sean, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Thank you. Now I'm excited to be here and excited to talk about the journey. Yeah. So why don't we start with a bit about you? What What are you doing now? Tell us a bit about what you're what you're doing now. We're going to get to how you got here. Sure. So since about fall of 2019, so about two and a half years, I have been owning, operating the Red Stuff Agency, which basically started kind of on a lark as this open-ended content writing business. And has really blossomed over that time. Still very free form. I call it industry agnostic. So I work with people across all different kinds of industries, a lot of legal, sure, but a lot beyond that as well. Helping businesses, I say, sound as good as they look and helping them tell their stories better. That's web copy, that's blogs, newsletters, articles, ebooks, some reports, anyone who's kind of looking for a different voice in how they do their storytelling. I'm here to help. Amazing. And so I just have to like pause for a second and say that Sean is one of the wittiest people that I have ever met. And so I think it's really worth noting that the Right Stuff Agency is spelt the right W-R-I-T-E stuff agency. And so maybe can you just, how did you come up with that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a funny question because when I'm talking because this is about trying to sort of get their personality out there, I'll ask them, you know, one of the questions about their name. How did your business get its name? And I wish I had a better story for mine. I actually think that my lovely wife thought of it first or I... I we can't recall who it was, but I saw I give her the credit. It defaults to her. She's pretty uh, witty too. Sitting on the couch one day and it came to us and it worked. And the you only know, agency part is because the right stuff obviously is used eight ways from Sunday. There's the kids on the block people joke about. There's the movie from the eighties. So the agency is there for a few reasons, partly to not get sued, <laughs> partly because, you know, it is bigger than just me. I didn't want to, you know, put my own name personally on anything. So it's. Kind of gives that sense as well as the business grows. And it's gone well. It's memorable. It makes people giggle. That's, you know, I think a good thing to have it. Get people to smile at least. For sure. And I love it. I love it. Thank so you. if we, if we could talk about where you started, because you didn't quite start here. No. So by no means. No. And so if we could take a step back, take us back to undergrad. What, what okay. were you doing? So we're going back about half a lifetime ago, which makes me feel like a fossil, but I'll, I'll take you on that journey. <laughs> you know, my full through childhood. Yeah. I was a late kid. I was kind of debating, okay, what do I want to do with my life? And law and journalism were really kind of the two areas that I was dabbling in between of, you know, what to do. I had always loved storytelling. I have behind me in this crazy chaos of my bookshelf, a reporter's notebook from about age five when, you know, I, you can see my name written in a very five-year script, but it was me kind of taking notes 30-something years ago, which is wild to think about now. And so, you know, as I was I was in the Baldry Elementary School newspaper, in the high school newspaper, so journalism was, was a very natural path. I'll talk about the legal sort of idea after, but obviously law here is not an undergrad, so you start doing something else regardless. So I got into journalism school, a fairly prestigious one, at age 17. I was young and I went off to school and started, you know, in this program that I loved and was so excited for. About three months in, I got sick. I got very ill just before the semester exams and the first semester. I might have having to basically come home in the middle of the night. I was sick for, I don't even know if you know the story. I was sick for mm -hmm. many months uh, and it totally sidelined me, took me out of the, you know, that chosen career, it took me out of a school that I loved, out of a city that I was loving. It was definitely a stress induced illness and it basically instantly pushed reset on, okay, what's your next game plan? So that led me into a school closer to home and it led me into a professional writing program that I thought would be 
you know, a close fit. Really wasn't. And so I ended up finishing undergrad with an English and history degree at the end of all of that. And in that journey, I was kind of going, okay, you know, I really am not sure what to do next. Went through university strike towards the end of it that, you know, took us all out of commission. I think present company included. Included. For a <laughs> couple months. You remember it well. Oh, I sure do. <laughs> oh, not, not a fun time. And we sort of, you know, we're looking at each other going, okay, what's next? And I hired a career coach at the time of a family friend. It was, you know, she was helping pro bono, which was very kind. Mm-hmm. And she gave me a few good points of guidance. One is that I didn't want to be a lawyer. In her words, you know, she mm-hmm. said lawyers are not happy at review and, you know, I'm not something that I want to do. Interested advice looking back. And, you know, she had me do a couple exercises, but she says, what do you really want to do? And I said, I want to go back into journalism. She said, go. And I, you know, it was as if someone gave me permission to do what I wanted to do again, which was such a nice blessing. And that day I looked at graduate programs through a couple of the colleges. You know, it was one of her suggestions. And I put my hat in for one that was quite competitive. And I got it. In that road, I should add, I had written my LSATs twice in undergrad. Uh, we talked about that. I don't want, want to talk too much. We can talk about that journey if you'd like. For sure. For sure. So yeah, let's, let's just stop here for a minute because I knew a little bit of this story, but certainly not in the level of detail that you've just shared. So what I want to know is, you know, how did you feel in that process of essentially being in a program that you really enjoyed and then for reasons beyond your control, having to actually stop? What was that? What was that like for you? It was pretty shattering at the time. I, and, and really, you know, it was, and so they call it conversion. The symptoms don't matter, but so they call it conversion disorder, where the brain basically breaks down and will do really crazy things to the body. So some people have blindness and it's quite literal blindness, even though they're ocularly, their eyes are perfect, but you know, they'll be able to see for a period of time. Mine resulted in other crazy things. And so it was, you know, basically having the rug ripped out from under you. And at 17, that's pretty young to have the rug ripped out from under you. And it wasn't, you know, I was ill and then got better quickly. I was actually quite sick and then kept getting sicker for a number of months. And that was very scary because, you know, you you want to plan for a future. You want to sort of believe that something better is around the corner. But when you're really seriously ill for a long time, it's hard to keep that faith. And so how did you? I mean, I think that that probably would have been a process. It was a process for sure. Life is life is a strange thing. Some of the things thankfully resolved after about four or five months and some treatment, and that was great. And then, you know, once you've been through that, and I have friends who have been through cancer journeys and others, when you've been chronic, and not to compare, but when you've been chronically ill for a time, it's very easy after a while to look at life as a before and after. Mm. You know, instead of your life is divided in two, it's okay, before I got sick and after I got sick. And that I think is very common to most people who've dealt with a serious illness for at least a couple of years. And then that kind of goes away. If, you know, thankfully, if you stay healthy, knock on wood, and that kind of levels out and mm-hmm. you, you look at it as, okay, it's, it's not a before and after, it's part of the journey. And right. it's part of, you know, what got you to where you are today. And so I've, I see that in hindsight. I don't know that I would have been happy finishing that program. I don't know that it's the right fit. It's like, I can't look back. We're not going that way. Right, right. And the universe has plans for us. Exactly. <laughs> Everything that's happened for better and for worse has gotten me to where I am today. So I'm going to say it's all for the better. And that's a pretty good place. Yeah, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'll tell yeah. you that. And we'll talk about that. And and I, I appreciate that you mentioned that you wrote the LSAT twice. And I've made it public here that I've written the LSAT twice, too. And the reason that I appreciate you bringing that up is because this is a real point of shame among applicants to have to write a standardized test twice, whatever it is. Before that, I wrote the MCAT. And so while you were going through that process, did you, how did you feel about having to write that test again? Did it bother you? Did you feel pressure? Were you always comfortable sharing that you had to write it twice? So we'll walk through the journey because truth be told, I wrote it four times, which is not something that, you know, a lot of people, like people go, oh, wait, you can only do three. It was four over the course of a number of years and it just divided a little bit. So yeah. I'll back the train up for a second. So okay. I had thought about, you know, going into law after my English degree because yada, 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 it seems like a fairly natural fit and it was a consideration. And so I had studied a little bit, very minimally on my own and wrote the test and didn't get a great score. And I went, okay, you know what? I didn't put that much work into this. I'm not generally strong in standardized tests anyway. Some folks are inherently good. I'm not on that list. So it was a fair bit of work 
And then I wrote again that summer and I had gotten some proper training. I was working with a friend who was a actual tutor and was doing better. And then I got hit with a tough test and some sections on there that you know, were not my strong suit. It was divided to sections, obviously. And mm-hmm. the Boda section was not my friend. And I just walked out feeling downtrodden. And I canceled my score. I spoke with that friend and that was his suggestion based on sort of how I walked out feeling. And I think it was the right decision to cancel. So, you know, I had one score that wouldn't have gotten me far anywhere. I had a second score that I canceled. And I went, you know, this is not really for me. I'm not ready for this. I'm not, you know, rushing off to law school right now. And that's when I went into journalism, into grad school. You know, mm-hmm. I said, okay, let's push pause on this. And maybe we'll revisit it after, you know, a grad program. Let's see. I was still... Yeah, I was the year 21. I was still very young. And so it was nice to sort of have that break and then reassess. I'm, I'm glad I did it. It's like, do you want to fast forward to sort of when I started doing the test again? Sure. Because <laughs> I can I go down that road. So I finish a journalism grad school that was the best two years I've had in my entire education. Some of the most fun I've had in my life. Mm-hmm. I had this dream internship that I loved. I was, you know, the college programs are wonderful and being very hands-on. So, you yeah, know, very practical newsroom and I'm out in the field, you know, using that reporter notebook again from 20 years before having the time of my life and could not land a job to save my soul coming out of school. I spent about six months on the hunt, couldn't get anything, you know, within my field. I was really reaching far and just coming up short and going, this is not the life that I pick out for myself. And it took me, you know, I remember very vividly being in my Pajamas one day on a Tuesday at like one o'clock, having just woken up, watching, you know, the Simpsons on TV going, mm-hmm. this is not my life. This is just not, you know, I'm, I'm destined for something bigger than this was kind of where it happened. And I had, as I actually recall now, I had a credit from a LSAT prep course that I hadn't used from a couple of years ago and they wouldn't give me the money back, but I held this credit for about three, four years and I called their bluff when I signed up for the test again. And I shouted to the company and said, Okay, ready to use that credit now. Well, this is definitely no problem by all means. And I signed up and I did the course again and I went to go work for a friend of mine for about a year. He knew when I took that job that law school was sort of on the horizon. And I wrote, I did a weekend prep course with those folks and I wrote a fall test and I still didn't do very well. And so, you know, I've come out of this test now three times and it hasn't gone great. And I said, okay, you know, this is, and this is probably around the time that we knew each other. And I, you know, wasn't there even a boot before that, forgive me. And I wasn't entirely sure, you know, what I was going to do next, because here I am, I was working in the HR field and I was doing well, you know, at my job, but I am realizing, okay, law might be a bit of a pipe dream. It's a little far out of reach. Fast forward, you know, for a quick anecdote is I had some trouble at work in terms of salary negotiations. And I thought, you know, I was going to be able to stay with them. They were really pressing me to not go to law school. And, you know, what they didn't know is the test hadn't gone well. So I was already considering not going. And then there were some headaches that came up with work. And I said, you know what? No, no. I, again, that voice of I'm destined for something. I don't know what I'm destined for, but it's something greater than this. And I signed up to write that test one more time. And applications were due. I had to, I was in a position where I had to apply without, you know, an LSAT work. And, had to do that later. And I was about to put all those apps on hold. This was, you know, end of October. I was going to just, you know, I'm going to push pause. And I basically took a lunch break from that job, called all my references again, said, nope, we're back on. And I pushed through, did a proper, you know, three months intensive, longest, longest few months of my life working, you know, 40, 50 hour weeks and then doing intensive, intensive test prep on top of that and commuting like crazy for both. But I did it. I got there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I want to pick up on a few things that you've said. Sure. Forgive um, me for going too long. N- no, please. Like, no, I, I'm so interested in your journey and in your experience. So like anything that, that you're, you're willing to share is <laughs> we're, we're game for it. So the first is that you were discouraged by people around you from applying for a few reasons. But one of them was that, you know, was difficulty with the LSAT. And so I think it's really important to just pause on this for a second because standardized tests don't actually indicate the kind of practitioner you're going to be. And they also don't indicate the kind of student that you're going to be and whether you're going to understand the material or not. So how do you, after having gone through that whole process and after having 
dealt with the comments from people about, oh, you're not, you know, the test isn't going so well for you. You might want to hit pause on that. But then doing it and getting in and going through the school and going through the process and becoming a lawyer, how much does the LSAT really matter? So it's a funny thing. I went to a fairly progressive law school and there's regularly calls to get rid of the LSAT as a standard. In hindsight, I can see what the LSAT does. And I can see, you know, what the LSAT is trying to do, because obviously if you're sort of figuring out a case and a theory of a case, well, a case is fairly linear. Okay, so this happened and this happened and this happened. You should have lined your decks up in a row. So if you're playing a logic game, for example, I understand the comparison. I don't think it's a great standard. It definitely does not represent, you know, what's will be as a practitioner. People bring all sorts of skills to the legal profession well above and beyond their ability to line up ducks in a row. So if you're going to be a litigator and you're going to be building cases and presenting cases, you know, regularly, it might be a great representation for you. If you're a different kind of lawyer entirely, that that's not your business or your practice, it doesn't represent you that well at all. I bring a lot of, you know, my personality into whatever I do. And I certainly did into my practice. And let me tell you, the LSAT doesn't gauge that. The other thing that I'll talk about, and I mean, I don't, I can't speak for all law schools, but at least at mine, no one talked about the LSAT ever again. That's right. Shared the odd, you know, story of, you know, writing the test, maybe the first week or two of school. Oh, you know, I was in Paris when I wrote doing the exchange and I had to find a testing center. I was doing this or doing that. It never comes up. And no judge is going to ask you what you got in your LSAT. And a law firm partner interviewing you is not going to ask you what you got in your LSAT. So it's a means to an end. But if it gets you to where you want to go, then the rest doesn't matter. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And it's my experience as well that no one cares after it's done. <laughs> after it's done, you'll never talk about it again. Unless, of course, you come on this podcast and I ask you to talk about everything. <laughs> so I appreciate that. And then the second thing that I wanted to pick up on was you said that you knew that you were destined for something greater than this. And I have felt that way, too, that, you know, you're doing something and you're just thinking like there's more. There's more here. Like, this is not my my ending point. This is not the end for me. And so in the moments that you feel like there's more, how do you, first of all, how do you identify that? And second, how do you move forward to finding the more? So the identification, partly it's, I'm sure, pride. I don't know if it goes the right word, but there's some pride. I work too hard. To be sitting in my pajamas, you know, and frankly, sitting in my pajamas at one o'clock on a Tuesday. I had just done six years of post-secondary. You know, I had I'd put in too much time and money and sweat equity to be that lazy, that unemployed, that unemployable. You know, I knew that I was I had to do something differently because there was something else there. I I wasn't going to settle. I I could have settled into a job where they were playing games with my salary. I could have settled into you know, a world where I was very much capped, you know, much lower than the life that I would have wanted for myself. I could have just settled, but I'm not the type to settle. So there is partly that. And, you know, my grandfather says that he's proud of me, which is always cute. But he made the point once he said, you know, that I don't stop. If I hit a brick wall, I go left or I go right. I don't just sort of stop and, you know, enjoy the view. I keep moving in some regard. And so that's involved a couple of pivots in my career that we'll get into, but just sort of going like, okay, what can I do differently to get to where I want to go? Yeah. Is the question that I keep asking myself. And it's, it's a question I recommend everyone asks themselves if they're not where they want to be. Absolutely. Well, I do differently to get to where I want to go. And the goalpost changes. It keeps yeah. changing. It keeps evolving with you. Exactly. It's not static. Right. And that's the, I think, beauty of advancement is that you're actually never done. I think it's so profound that you're never done and in in the best way possible, that there's always more for you, more opportunity, more in your journey. Learning never stops. Growth never stops. That's right. nor, nor should they. And that's what life is all about. That's right. That's right. And so, OK, so you went in, you went to law school. So I went to law school. So I got in, I had, you know, I had this job that I knew sort of had a bit of an end date by my own choice. I was in a relationship where we were sort of, you know, looking at each other going, well, what if I do get in? And actually asked 
we had that conversation the next day and got it. So I got the letter and I was accepted to start that fall and moved about four hours away to start my law school journey. And once you got there, how did you feel? Because you at the time had already gone through a lot. You weren't coming in straight out of undergrad. You had a lot of life experience and you had a graduate degree on your way into law school. And so how how do you think that your journeys through law school was informed by your previous experience or perhaps how how did your feelings through law school and how you perhaps dealt with challenges how was that informed by your prior experience so it's an interesting question i got it at 25 and i'm really happy that i went when i did i'm really happy that i didn't go away at 21 there's really sort of two crowds in most being law schools there's the crowd coming in just from undergrad yeah. And my mother went to law school after two years of undergrad, back when you can still do that. Mm -hmm. And so she just saw it as more school. My mother doesn't have a bachelor's degree. She mm -hmm. just went right in. So she just kind of saw it as, okay, I'm just on the train and the train keeps moving and that's it. And there's certainly folks like that who, you know, are 21 or 22 and they're coming in right out of an undergrad program and, you know, they're still very green and they're incredibly smart. And they just say, okay, I'm going to put in these years of work and, you know, they'll get there. And suddenly, you know, by 25, there are a full-fledged lawyer, and that's great. I sort of looked at myself in the mirror before I left and went, okay, I'm putting a lot of my life on hold for presumably the next four years, mm -hmm. that I might not be, you know, settling down with a partner in the next four years. I might not be having children in the next four years. Like, okay, well, mm -hmm. other people might want to do all that, and that's great, but that's not going to be my path. I'm really happy that I did what I did. It was the right move. I was better prepared to be far away from home. I was better prepared to deal with sort of life situations. I was better prepared to deal with stresses. Mm -hmm. It was definitely the right fit. And that little bit of life experience, law school is a funny place because you really, once you're there, you all end up in the same place. And you have know, some folks have come from private schools and some from public schools and some from, you know, master's degrees. And there's always you know, usually a PhD or two. And then the folks who are right from undergrad, you know, look, everyone comes with a different lens, but you really all wind up in the same spot at the end of the day. And then what you do with that spot is entirely up to you. That's right. And so I also, you know, as you alluded to, I was, I, I started law school at 26. So by 26, I had that PhD. And I just know that when I was in law school, because I had done that previous graduate work, and even if it had just, you know, even if I had come in with a master's, even without the PhD, I would have had for sure a different lens than coming in out of undergrad. Because in my experience, there's a lot of growth that happens in a graduate degree no matter what it is. And so what do you think that growth was for you that came out of a graduate degree before going to law school? Journalism really is an amazing background for law as I see it. You know, there's a lot of folks with English degrees and that's great. But to me, I still think of myself as a journalist before I think of myself as a lawyer. You know what? That's funny. I think of you first as a journalist. Because <laughs> I, I don't shut up, as you can tell from this podcast. <laughs> I ask a lot of questions. Well, I'm not doing that here. It frames how I see the world, it frames how I collect and gather stories. I'm always curious. I always want to learn about someone. I want to learn about, you know, what makes them tick. So that's a really interesting skill as a lawyer because, you know, you get to sort of have a different relationship with your clients and you get to, you know, have that different connection. You learn, you really remember the story of, you know, your client in their case because it kind of lives within you. But it really showed me a lot, you know, as a journalist, you learn a little bit about a lot of things and you're sort of trying to really then collect that information and synthesize it in a way that you can tell someone just that hint of that story and why that story matters. So that's a really good background, you know, to come into law school with is, okay, there's a lot of information flowing at me, you know, eight ways from Sunday and that's fine. But if I'm going to learn this, you know, archaic statute from the 1530s, I can then sort of have that sense of, hey, there's a broader world out there. I've seen some of it. And be, okay, how does this actually fit into the greater puzzle? And yeah. that's hard to have that lens if you don't have that lived experience. I think that that's, those, those are both really great points. The first that you, you have a life outside of law school. And the second is that you are able to process the information in a way that you understand how it fits in the broader scheme of things. And those are, those were true for me too. And so I appreciate that you raised that because 
being able to, for example, like my, the research that I was doing, am still doing, and what I was teaching as a professor at the time that I was in law school was all health related, health policy, pharmaceutical policy, regulation and fraud. And that really helped me to understand the application of law, even if it wasn't directly related to my research. So stuff that I was reading in like torts or contracts, like I understood where that was situated in real life. Mm-hmm. And that was so helpful because these topics and concepts that would have otherwise been so abstract had a place. Did you find it, that too? It's still, you know, it, it's one of the things that's inherent in law schools, right? Now, when you're taking first year contracts and property, it's really hard to sort of understand where it all fits together. But you go, okay, property, maybe you're learning, you know, rules from, you know, 16th century England, but property fits into real estate and trusts and wills. And also the things that are really very hands-on, not just in legal, but in day-to-day life, you know, okay, there's something here, you know, that all fits together. You've, you, same thing you've done and you had, you know, a lot of real world experience, but you've done that research. You've seen what that world looks like and you kind of go, okay, this may be dry as toast, but I know why this is happening. That We all go through that, right? You know, we go through high school calculus and if we're not good at math, wonder why in the world are we sitting in this calculus class? I'm not sure that I can still tell you, but you know, it it is good to have that sort of broad background as much as you can get out of it and you walk in with a different appreciation. Yeah. And also through grad school, there's a lot of personal growth that happens that for me at least affects the way that I was able to handle challenges through law school. Did you find the same thing? Yeah, I was definitely more mature. There's no question. You know, when I, I did, there's a funny photo with a friend of mine who went to med school the same time that I went to law and we were, you know, both going back into residence at 25 into the dorms and we looked at each other going, what are we doing? You know, so I was in residence at 17 and I was, you know, a party animal at 17, too young to drink, and too young to even drink in Quebec, you know, and trying to figure, you know, navigate the world and early relationships and all that other sort of stuff. And at 25, I was an adult and a young adult. Sure. You know, I know more today at 35 than I did at 25 for sure. Mm-hmm. But I, I knew how the world worked a little bit. I knew, you know, the importance of looking after myself, looking after those around me, taking care. I wasn't just there to party. You know, I was there to war and I was there to sort of really be, grow and develop even further than I had. So it's a different, different view for sure. For sure. And I, I completely, totally relate, actually, totally relate. So you went through law school mm-hmm. and then you wrote the bar article and were called. So I know that I'm skipping over a lot here, All good. <laughs> but you then were working as a lawyer. You were practicing as a lawyer. So I was called to the bar. I was, I articled at a firm that I knew wasn't hiring back, which was actually a bit of a blessing. I knew, you know, that I didn't have the opportunity to stay. And so I had to go off and, you know, go forge my own. And I couldn't find anything for a couple of months. And so, you know, I went into law school because I didn't know what to do with my life and couldn't find a job. I come out of law school, couldn't find anything. And I went, oh, okay, now this is interesting. And I, the beauty with a law degree is you always have a backup plan. You could always go hang your shingle, as they say, and, you know, go off and practice on your own. Doesn't mean it's easy, doesn't mean it's fun, doesn't mean it's what people want to do. But inherently, you are self-employable, which is a nice little cushion. I didn't want to do that. I wasn't there yet. And I had trouble at first finding something. I didn't land my first law job until about six months afterwards, when I actually had a couple opportunities that came together all at once. And so I took one of those. Mm -hmm. And so could you tell me a bit about your experience practicing leading up to the point where you decided, this isn't for me, I'm going to actually do something of my choosing. So I, I've made that decision twice, funny enough. Yes. <laughs> the first time I had, you, know, you call me your friends, but I practiced for a couple months at a very small firm, trying to build up my own book of business. It was not a great fit. It was not a great experience. I really tried as hard as I could. And after about five, six months, I said, I liked parts of the job for sure, but there were enough headaches aside from the firm headaches that I said, you know what, this is not for me. I, this was not my childhood dream. I tried it. Okay. I walked away. I did other things for a while. I did some contract work. I did some marketing work. I got called back in by what I thought was my dream firm who had said to me, you know, if you ever do want to come back, now's your chance. They had an opening for a parental leave position. And I said, you know, I, 
I'm not going to leave full-time for parental leave, but if you want to make it a full-time position, I'll take it. And they agreed. And so I went back into practice for a year and the first few months went quite well. And I was happy and engaged and, you know, loving the opportunity and loving being back in it and using my brain, et cetera. And then it really started to go south for me in terms of mental health. I started having, you know, real challenges. I don't blame the firm. It was a whole host of things. It was uh, we can get into that after for a second, but there are a lot of stresses that came together where I started to realize that, you know, look, this is not for me. This is not the life that I wanted. I wound up in a, a fairly ugly place because of mental health and eventually said, you know, I, I need to, I need to make an exit. And so I made an exit just actually before that year was up. So could we pause on that for a sec? Cause I think that a lot of people experience this and a lot of people who are young lawyers experience high rates of burnout in the first, in the first, I would say five years. And so could you maybe talk a bit about what you experienced during that time? I'm glad to. It's with young lawyers. I don't know any young lawyer that doesn't experience stress and that doesn't experience, you know, some sleepless nights and they talk about the Sunday scaries and you know, all the stuff that comes up and they're all kind of looking at each other going, okay, well, is this normal for you or is this normal for me or what have you? I heard a senior lawyer once explain it as kind of the three week rule where you're going to have hard days and you're going to have hard weeks and that's okay. But if you're really miserable and you probably have your own theories, but she said, if you're really miserable for more than three weeks in a row, it may be time to look at, you know, is this something fixable or not from the profession? And maybe it's environmental, maybe it's firm, maybe it's practice area, maybe it's the law. In my case, I, you know, started having very aggressive anxiety, a real sort of slide into depression. I, my focus and clarity and engagement were starting to really go on me. I was in a very sort of stressful environment where others, you know, were having a difficult time as well. I had pursued some counseling through the employee assistance program, I think initially through work, who, you know, she'd done a couple of sessions as a social worker. She said, you're not depressed, you just need another job. And then at the time, I kind of, you know, nodded and smiled and went, okay, I was about to go on my honeymoon. And so I said, let me travel. I don't want to sort of, you know, rock the boat before I go away. Let me take my mind off. I don't know if that'll help. And I did. We went to Europe and had this lovely two weeks. And, you know, thankfully the firm was great. And they didn't expect much from me while I was gone, which was nice. And I came back and within about three days. I was right back to where I was before I left. And I said, okay, this is, I, I have had a history like many folks and many lawyers with anxiety, depression, et cetera, not foreign territory, but things were getting quite bad. And I had done some more counseling and thankfully also consulted with a relative who was a psychiatrist. And I, the irony was I was a workplace mental health lawyer. Mm -hmm. Doing a lot of workplace mental health work, helping, you know, employees through their own stress leaves and, how to navigate that territory. And I basically became my own clients. And I, mm. I didn't really know on the ground, you know, law is very much an exercise in preventative medicine and how to sort of fix problems after they occur. I was trying to avoid that problem before it happened. Mm. So I was, you know, I didn't want to get myself fired. Frankly, I didn't want to, you know, quit in a, a huff. I really was sort of going, okay, what am I watching for here? I know that I'm not doing well. What's going to be the next move? And by the end, I was basically catatonic. I mean, you could have thrown a rock at me and I wouldn't have flinched. It was pretty unpleasant. And at the very, you know, my relationships, my friendships, my, I had a new marriage that was, you know, certainly impacted. I, the coping strategies I was using were no longer holding up. So all the meditation, the relaxation, et cetera, wasn't really doing it. I was no longer finding joy in the rest of my life. And I, I'm a consular professional, really only at the end, I think, did the work noticeably start to suffer. And I said, okay, that's all she wrote. So I left that medical leave. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. And I know that anyone who's listening, who's experienced something similar will also appreciate hearing this because all of this happens behind closed doors. And it's really only when we're having a, a pretty honest conversation behind I still these happen behind closed doors that that someone else is able to hear about it so I do really appreciate that you're sharing this on a public stage I think that it's really important to share these experiences firstly so that if somebody else is going through this they don't feel alone and second they know that there's a way out I'll say this there's you know countless lawyers and I will say countless that 
deal with mental health and anxiety yes. issues. It is, you know, we are often type A personalities and we're high functioning and high stress and it sort of lends itself naturally. And look, there are lawyers, that doesn't mean that you can't be a, a lawyer, it doesn't mean you can't be a great lawyer. So there are lawyers who learn how to cope and function really well in spite of, you know, their challenges and some use them as an asset, work with them, and that's great. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't be practicing law as a rule, but there are other people for whom it's a sign that says, maybe this isn't the career for me. And, you know, I don't think we talk about that enough. You know, we talk about the conversation is opening in the bar and that's great and how to sort of work with it and, you know, use it within your practice. And that's all well and good. But I don't think we hear that voice enough that says, hey, maybe it's actually the career. For me, I, you know, it's odd, but okay, what do I do next? I didn't want to move firms. I would have been a fool to move firms. This would have happened to me all over again. So there are certainly, you know, concerns that I had with the shop that I was with. Again, like I said, we're good friends. I don't blame them for anything, but it would have happened all over again. It wasn't that. It was, it was me. And that's, you know, it's not a fit for everybody. And that's okay too. Yeah. And the fact that it wasn't a fit, as you say, is fine. Mm -hmm. It's fine. And I think that just back on your point about, you know, if you're experiencing these sorts of feelings or feelings extended over a period of time doesn't mean that you won't be a good lawyer if it is what you want to do. But maybe the pl the place isn't right for you. The type of work isn't right for you. And I think it's also really important to know that you can be a lawyer or whatever it is on your own terms. Yes. Right. Exactly. You don't have to rely on a firm for a firm or a specific firm or a specific person for work. Like there are other opportunities. There are other options. And for other reasons, like me, you can go out on your own and really do what you want to do without having to answer to other people and have my schedule dictated by others. And so it is absolutely possible that you can make whatever it is that you're doing your own. You could do that. There's so much law is not one thing. It is mm -hmm. not painted with one brush. You can't paint multiple firms with the same brush. There's so many different ways yeah. to practice different ways to do things, different types of law, working on your own, working part and small for, I practiced in small firms. I worked in another role at a big firm, seen a bit of the gamut. I have a lot of friends now and clients who are solo, sole practitioners. There's a million different ways to do things, whether it's in practice, out of practice, private practice, public practice, teaching, what have you, you know, so don't let anybody paint you into a corner. You have the turpentine, you can get on that corner whenever you please. There's That's a million right. different ways you can do it. That's right. And you did. I did. And you did. So what was that process like for you? So that process was really, you know, and I'll, I'll be frank in that I had what they call doc review, which is a lot of, you know, lawyers in transition wind up taking on this third party contract review work. I did it with the first time I left practice and, you know, it was sort of my roads out and to earn some income while I figured out next step. It's great transitory work and I'd give it full credit. It, it you know, saved my bacon financially and mentally and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I'd done that for a while after living practice now and figured, okay, I don't want to do it. Some folks do it forever and that's fine. I didn't want to. So I didn't know what was coming next. And I had always written, I had written, you know, for the last firm I was with and the firms before that and for other shops and small businesses and done content writing. It was kind of always the side project. And I, you know, I kept it up a little bit and I said, maybe there's something here. And, you know, my, refer back to my wife who's much smarter than I am. And she kind of elbowed me in the ribs and went, you know, you're a writer going right. And I had written, you know, in between, I had won a couple national blog awards for a legal blog that I had for a while yeah. when I started when I wasn't in practice and I ran mostly, you know, when I wasn't in practice just for the sake of using that journalistic lens to explain complicated things to people in a simple way and making complicated things simple. And I realized that maybe that's an actual marketable skill. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, you know, while I was still doing that document review, I kind of shingled for this business and said, hey, I'm available to go straight. I'd never done that before. And thankfully, people were interested. People, you know, knew that I could write because they read my other stuff. Mm -hmm. And they knew that I could tell stories. And thankfully, some friends started to take a chance on me. And they liked what they saw. And then they started referring others. And it really grew from there. And it actually has turned into, thank goodness, not on my desk, a fairly successful business. So I, I was hampered by a lot of, not so much self-doubt, but a lot of doubts about, you know, the marketability of writing and the financial viability of a writing career and my lack of marketing experience, my lack of business experience. 
And, you know, we talked about before we said recording the budgets, you know, you got to do it. Just kind of have to go out and give it a shot. And I, I, I had it multiple times in my career bet on the wrong horse. And I said to myself, if I bet on myself, I can't lose. And that's what this has come from. And thankfully, you know, been able to do all right. Yeah. And I think, I think you've, you've put it really well that you've just got to do it. Don't yeah. let fear stand in your way. Don't let the what if stand in your way. If you feel in true alignment with what it is that you are planning and what it is that you're thinking about and mulling over and that you're ready to do, don't let that fear stand in your way. Just do it. You're never going to have all the questions answered. You're never going to know exactly what's going to happen. And you will face challenges along the way. But you just do it. And then you figure everything out. Progress, not perfection. That's right. And we never, like, there's always stuff to figure out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's always going to be stuff to figure out. So just start, right? It's all all about the journey. I'm still on the journey. I mean, this is this is my thing. This is where my career road hopefully stops. But I'm launching an adventure this afternoon. I'm trying other new things. It's never static. It's never done. You're never done learning and you're never done exploring opportunities. So. Right. And when you're in a place where you feel in alignment, because I can tell the, the difference in your, your, the way you're sitting, your face is different when you're talking about what you do now versus what you did before. And, well, and you we're mm-hmm. friends, you've known me a long time, right? So have, you yes. know me through these incarnations and mm-hmm. you see the change in me. I, I am myself again. Yes. That I was not. Right when I was practicing. Yeah. And so you can see when somebody is in alignment with, with themselves, with themselves. And I think something that's also really important to just draw upon is that the personal is connected very closely with the professional. The personal and the professional are one and the same. We're the same person. And so your personal has to be in alignment with what you're doing professionally. It just has to be. And so. I just, I can see that for you in this venture, and this is not the end, right? You've got all sorts of new things coming your way. And I've already seen how, how the right stuff has grown. And it's just like so much fun to watch because I can tell you love it. I do. Like, life is too short not to be happy. I know you're not going to be happy all the time and there's always going to be challenges, yeah. but find joy where you can. If practicing law brings you joy, phenomenal. Have fun. I, yeah. I know a few classmates that still love it and that's great. But if it doesn't, that's okay too. That's right. And you find what does. Yep, exactly. And you find what does. But for you, in the right stuff, you're using a lot of the skills that you've, you're using all the skills that you've developed along the way. And so how are you able to connect the dots looking back? Because you can't connect the dots looking forward, right? We don't have a crystal ball. So while we're going through these really hard times, we think to ourselves, what what place does this experience have in my day-to-day? I had a lot of regret. After leaving school that I, re- you know, asking myself that I regret ever going, that I regret, you know, the career choice, you know, you know, being that unhappy with myself, that sick. I've checked that at the door. I don't have regrets anymore. It's all part of the journey. Yeah. To me, you know, and I, it looks like this sort of, you know, zigzag career path on paper and that's okay. And to me, it's all part of my story and it's all what's part of your story, what makes you unique. And so my story is that I, did a bit of this and a bit of this. And I can, Joe could be self-deprecating about it. And I am, but I don't take myself too seriously. But, you know, it's all part of that journey. I have no regrets about any of it. For sure. I completely agree. And and so thank you for sharing all of that. Looking back, what advice would you give to your younger self? I have asked myself this, you know, looking back. I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say to do anything differently. I think so to keep in the faith, stick with it, believe in yourself, that you have the resources within yourself to get you to where you want to go. Listen to your gut, listen to your instincts. Your instincts are pretty good. Believe in yourself above what others are telling you, right or wrong. You know, don't worry about putting this person, that person on a pedestal. Trust yourself. And you'll get to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I agree with it fully. So thank you so much for joining us here today. I am so grateful for this conversation that we've had. I just, I'm so grateful for everything that you've shared. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure.
All right. Well, thank you so much for listening and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.